told we should take more care over what we eat. Advice from the government, from magazines, it's all telling us to eat a healthier diet. But to decide what we should eat and how it affects our bodies, we have to understand what happens to food after we've eaten it. Digestion. In this program, we'll be looking at digestion and what happens after that, but concentrating on just one component of our diet, probably the one we all worry about most, fat. This is fat, human fat. When we talk about fat, sometimes we mean the fat in our bodies, sometimes we mean the fat in the foods we eat. By the end of this program, you'll understand how one becomes the other. But these days, even the mention of fat seems to worry people. This young woman is not fat, but she's so unhappy about the amount of fat stored by her body that she's having it surgically removed, an operation called liposuction. A thin needle is introduced under the skin and the fatty tissue is sucked out. You might not want to go to these extremes to lose weight, but it does give us a real chance to see fat as it is stored in our bodies. Here it is. So, what is fat? What we call fat is a group of molecules called lipids. They have a backbone of glycerol attached to three or more long fatty acid chains. These lipid molecules are one of the body's fuels. They can be broken down with oxygen to release energy. This program is the story of what happens to them in our body. But if fat is just another chemical used by our body for energy, what have we got to be so worried about? People equate fat with bad. It's essential to have fat for life. It's a form of storage of energy. The problem in the Western society is where we are storing too much fat, either because people eat too much or they don't do enough exercise. So there's a balance to be struck here, a balance between how much fat we take in, that's eating and the processes of digestion, and how much fat we burn for energy. To understand what happens to fat, we have to understand the balance between input and output. First things first, let's look at the input side of the equation. How does fat get from our food into our body? Obviously, the place to start is the mouth. Chewing, the first important part of the digestive process, cutting and slicing the food into smaller pieces. Smaller pieces of food, larger surface area for the molecules that break down food, enzymes, to attack. When you swallow, your chewed up food heads south down the esophagus, the pipe leading to the stomach. But food isn't just falling down the esophagus, it's being pushed. The esophagus, like all the tubes of the guts or gastrointestinal tract, is lined with muscle. Waves of muscular contraction, called peristalsis, force food down the tube. At the bottom of the esophagus, the stomach. This stomach is empty. Normally, it would contain a soupy mixture of gastric juices and broken up food. The stomach is important for breaking down protein molecules, but nothing much happens to fat here. It's the next stage that's really important. And that's when this muscular sphincter opens and the food enters the small intestine. Here, things start to get complicated, especially the plumbing. Ducts from two other organs, the liver and the pancreas, join the small intestine. Each releases a substance that's important for the breakdown of fat. First, there's a greenish liquid called bile. It's a solution of salts produced in the liver, stored in a small sac, the gallbladder, and released into the intestines as the food arrives. The pancreas then releases another fluid to join the show, this time containing enzymes. The body produces different enzymes to break down different types of food, and they're named after the type of food they attack. The enzymes that attack fat are called lipases because they attack lipids. The bile and the enzymes from the pancreas mix together. But to understand what's happening to fat, we need to take a much closer look. By the time the fat enters the small intestine, it's in the form of droplets, like the droplets of fat in milk. But the body can't absorb fat in this form, and that's where the bile comes in. The bile salts emulsify the fat, dispersing it into much smaller droplets. 
now the smaller droplets can be attacked by the enzymes from the pancreas. Individual fat molecules are broken down by the lipases into their components of fatty acids and glycerol. Only when this has happened can the fat be absorbed by the body. But where does the absorption take place? Further on in the intestine, you can see the walls are covered in tiny projections called villi, which increase the surface area of the intestines. Each villus has a rich blood supply and a duct in the center called a lacteal. The broken down fats pass through the cells on the surface of the villi, either directly into the blood or collecting in the lacteal first. But where does the fat go now? Directly to the body's main chemical factory, the liver. The liver is a combination of factory, chemical works and truck depot. Fat can either be burnt immediately for energy, used to make other chemicals, or sent off to other parts of the body to be stored. But how can we find out which of these things is happening to fat? And at the moment, um, for two reasons... We can't measure what's happening in the liver directly, but we can measure the chemical reactions indirectly by measuring the waste products expelled from the body. Fat is burnt with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide, water and energy. So, by collecting in a hood the air someone breathes out and measuring the amount of carbon dioxide and oxygen present, we can make an indirect measurement of how much fat is being burnt. Caroline is lying down, doing as little as possible. By measuring the carbon dioxide and oxygen in the air she breathes out, the computer can calculate the amount of energy she's generating just to keep her body ticking over. This measurement is called the basal metabolic rate. Here you can see the results on the screen. If she stayed in this position, she would be burning 6,000 kilojoules of energy in a 24-hour period. OK, let's see what happens if, if Carolyn moves about a bit now and, and exerts some effort. Carolyn, would you like to wiggle your feet and hands vigorously, more vigorously than that? If you can, that's it, that's very good. Go on, keep going, keep going. That's it, very good, very good. Keep going. Excellent. Keep wiggling. That's it. Keep wiggling. There we are. And there's a jump there. The energy she is using increases. The body responds to an increase in activity That's That's by burning fuel to produce more energy. No surprises there. But there's a problem. Burning fat isn't the only chemical reaction in the body that produces carbon dioxide and water. The breakdown of glucose produces the same waste products. So how can we be sure that this setup is measuring fat? Very good. Keep going. We need to construct a fair test that can tell us how much of the energy produced by our bodies is due to fat. The first thing we need to do is isolate our experimental subjects from the outside world. These small rooms are calorimeter chambers. They're sealed boxes fed by an air supply that can be continually monitored and analysed. Do the minders, and before I shut the doors, you know that the panic cord is, is over there, you need to contact me. Also, a single experiment may involve the subject being shut in the box for up to a week. It may not be real life, but it's a better test because at least you can sit, get up, walk around, eat and sleep while still being measured. So far, so good, just a bigger version of the hood. The scientist measures the outputs of the body's chemical reactions by recording the concentration of gases in the chamber at different times, to how much oxygen is consumed, and how much carbon dioxide produced. The chamber is kept at a constant temperature to allow fair comparisons to be made between different people. That takes care of the outputs of the body's chemical reactions, but the scientist needs to be able to control the inputs, the raw material that goes into the body, food. The meals given to the experimental subjects are specially prepared. The scientists know exactly how much fat and carbohydrate they contain. The amounts can be varied. Some people are fed high-fat foods, others low-fat, but care is taken to make sure that all taste the same so the subjects don't know what they're eating. Yes, that's your luncheon. Remember and fill in the questionnaire 15 minutes after you've eaten. 
Okay. So, in the calorimeter, the scientists control what goes into the body and measure what comes out. But there's another factor that can also be measured in the calorimeter. The subjects can be put on different exercise regimes. In every 24-hour period, one subject might be asked to spend two hours pedaling on the exercise bike. This can then be compared with another subject who's fed the same diet but takes less exercise, or perhaps none at all. Using the calorimeter chambers, we can construct a fair test of which elements in our diet are used to produce energy. But we're particularly interested in fat, so what can the results of experiments like these tell us? Our bodies are continually balancing the food we take in with the amount of energy we need. The body can burn either carbohydrate or fat for energy, but it can't store them equally well. The body does store some carbohydrate in the form of glycogen, mainly in the liver, but it's only a few hundred grams, a short-term store. Since it can't store it, the body burns any excess carbohydrate straight away. But with fat, it's a very different story. Fat is easily stored in the adipose tissue under the skin. More fat in the diet than the body needs, and it can be stored for the future. Fat is like a reserve fuel tank for the body. We all store some fat, but do we all store the same amount of fat? Let's take three volunteers and find out. Three different bodies, three very different shapes. First, Kish. The machine we're going to use to look at the fat in Kish's body is a magnetic resonance body scanner. Kish lies on the bed and is transported into the magnet. This scanner has been specially tuned to reveal fat. Tissues rich in fat show up in white. Here you can see the fat in Kish's head and shoulders. You might be surprised to see that his brain contains a lot of fat. Now the scanner is tuned, we can start to look at where fat is stored in Kish's body. The research team push Kish through the scanner, stopping every two centimeters to take a scan through his body. Having completed over 80 individual scans, we can look at the distribution of fat from one end of Kish's body to the other your neck there and your arms. The white around here, that's the fat. And the black in the middle, that's the muscle. Okay, we'll we'll start the at the top. This is a cross section through the neck in the center and the arms on either side. The first thing you notice is the layer of adipose tissue under the skin. Everyone has adipose tissue, it acts as insulation, retaining the heat generated by the body's chemical reactions and maintaining our body temperature. But what else can we see as we move down through the body? Here we're at the level of the heart. The lungs are the two dark holes on either side. The white area in the middle is fat surrounding the heart. So there is fat inside the body as well as just under the skin. Moving further down, here's the liver showing up in grey. You can see that all of Kish's internal organs are surrounded by a packing of fat tissue. And now you can see that at the level of the abdomen on the top and the buttocks on the bottom, the adipose layer is thicker too. Time to compare this with volunteer number two, Ben. Ben is obviously thinner than Kish, so you might expect less fat, but will it be in the same places? Again, he's scanned every two centimeters. It's obvious right from the start that Ben just doesn't have as much fat as Kish. Instead of a layer of adipose tissue centimeters thick, Ben has only a very thin layer, no more than a couple of millimeters. And there's very little internal fat either. Almost no fat around the heart, 
and very little around the internal organs. And at waist level, the adipose layer is no thicker than anywhere else. As we get older, we tend to deposit more fat, both internally and externally. And men tend to deposit that fat in particular places, around the waist. But how about comparing Ben with a woman of a similar age, another Caroline? Caroline's neck and arms look pretty similar to Ben's. Maybe a slightly thicker layer of adipose tissue, but that's what you would expect. Women are better insulated than men. They tend to have a thicker layer of fat spread more evenly across the body. Obviously, her breasts contain fatty tissue, but like Ben, Caroline has very little fat around her internal organs or her abdomen. Around her hips, the adipose tissue is slightly thicker. But we've only looked at three individuals. Is there any pattern to the differences between where people lay down fat? People, for example, when they start putting weight on, they start putting the weight in different areas. So we have that people put weight around their waist here, and you end up with a large girdle around your waist, or around your hip, or in your arm, under your arms, as you can see, or on your back. And there's a certain area, so you end up like an overcoat of fat that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's interesting that in men, you tend to get that all the fat gets around the waist, and in women, it's more prom prominent around the hip. And that's why women always tend to talk about saying, you know, losing the hips because they're too large, and men end up with beer guts. We can take the individual scans of fat from our three volunteers and build up three-dimensional images of their bodies. We can then slice through these 3D images to look at the fat distribution from any angle. It's as if all the other body tissues, muscle, bone, intestines, have been scooped out. But it's amazing how much an image composed only of fat looks like a whole body. You can probably even recognize our three subjects. The distribution of fat is a major factor in the shape of our bodies. That's why how we feel about our bodies and what they look like is very tied up with the amount of fat we store. In the past, bodies with more fat were seen as very attractive. Now, different shaped bodies are fashionable with very little fat, perhaps less than is healthy. And some people feel under so much pressure to lose fat that they have it surgically removed. But should we get so worked up about it? There are some reasons we should. Here you can see the fat around the heart that we saw on the MRI scans earlier. But this patient has more serious problems than that. She has coronary heart disease. The blood vessels that supply her heart muscles have become blocked with fatty deposits. The surgeon is replacing them with sections of veins from her leg, all caused by too much fat in the diet. Fat can be your friend or your foe. It's up to you to choose. <laughs>